Good evening, table. There you go. Hey, before uh, Josh scoots off, I don't know if you heard the news yet or not, but he and Christy had Princess Kate, and so he is uh, a daddy again, and uh, so we want to say uh, congratulations to Josh and Christy, and uh, you don't have a picture this time? I've got, we don't have it, I don't think they have it up there. Okay, so see Josh, he's got bunches of pictures, but keep praying for, uh, for Christy and Josh and this a uh, few weeks of transition as they get to know uh, Kate, and Kate gets to know them, and what a great thing. And uh, so I'm glad for that. I'm excited for him. Uh, on your chairs, everyone got a uh, white uh, index card, and they're there for a reason, believe it or not. And uh, what we want you to do is starting on June 13th, we're going to do a short series called Q&A. And uh, we kind of do these in the summer, and uh, we let you ask the questions, and then we attempt to do our best to answer those questions. And so if you have questions about the Bible or uh, United Methodist Church or faith or religion or God or any of those, any of the above, um, we want to encourage you to write your question down on this white sheet of paper here. And then later on in the worship service, when you, the offering uh, bowl goes by, um, you get to drop that in there. And uh, we're going to do our best to uh, answer as many of those questions as we can. So we're going to try and we're going to pray real hard that God will kind of form all those questions into some sort of uh, message. And uh, so for uh, three weeks in June, we'll be answering as many of those questions as we possibly can. So if you have a burning question in your heart, in your soul, um, take the moment to write it down, and uh, then we'll do our best to try and answer that question. Okay? Sound good? Awesome. Well, before we go any further, um, I just want to invite you to pray with me. And we just sang about the power of God and uh, the presence of God. And um, I don't know about you, but what I've been praying in my time is that my hunger for God would grow, that my, my hunger and my appetite for God would grow. And I'm learning that the more you eat something, the more you want it, the more you crave it, right? The more you hunger for it. So the more you spend time with God, check this out, the more hungry you will be for God. And so, uh, so I've been praying that God would just give me this like insatiable appetite for God. And uh, so let's just pray though, and let's ask God to be um, to walk with us through tonight. Father God, we just thank you again for tonight. We thank you for um, the opportunity to gather together. And God, my prayer is tonight that as we open up your word, you would help us to grow together. And God, that you would challenge us and encourage us through your Holy Spirit to go and to share the good news with people um, that are outside of the walls of this building. Father, we're the church, your people, us. And Lord, you've called the church to not be in a building, but you've called the church to go out and to share your gospel, your good news with every man, every woman, every child. So God, would you, um, would you give us like this, this appetite for you? God, would you give us this hunger, this thirst for you that we can't get enough of you, Lord? And God, uh, and that's kind of a dangerous, crazy, risky prayer. Uh, God, that's my prayer and that, uh, that I would never be satisfied and I'd always want more of you. God, because you are powerful. Your name is powerful. Just to speak your name is powerful. And so God, we thank you for, um, for what you're going to do with us tonight. And so God, would you just remove the scales from our eyes? Uh, would you unplug our ears and soften our hearts even so that we can see, hear, and know exactly what it is that you desire for us to know tonight, God, and that we would leave here different than when we came because we've encountered the living God. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, I'm really excited that you're here tonight. Welcome back. It is so good to uh, always see each of you here. And if you're here for the first time tonight, just let, I want to say welcome to the table. Thanks for joining us. Maybe this is your second or third time. Uh, we're grateful that you're here, and, uh, and we love guests, and we love people checking out who God is, checking out the table, gathering around the table. As Pastor Jamie said, that's like a, an intimate thing, and that's a really neat picture um, of what we desire here on Wednesday nights, just to kind of gather around God's table and to break open his word, talk about him, um, live and do life with him. And so we've been in this series or this conversation that we've been having, uh, maybe even a journey, if you will. We've been kind of on a journey through the book of Genesis, and we've been looking at different characters that have stories that can help us to have a stronger faith. So we've just been looking at characters in the book of Genesis, and uh, and, and and as we look at these characters, we're discovering ways that these characters uh, give us examples of how our faith can grow stronger. And so we've looked at Noah. We looked at Noah in the first week. We've looked at Abraham. Um, we looked at last week at Jacob. And tonight we're going to look at a guy named Joseph. 
and uh, who had a faith that helped him to overcome some pretty amazing obstacles in his life. And so um, how many of y'all like, like great comeback stories? Anyone like a good comeback story? Like, yeah, we do, right? We all love comeback stories. Now, Pastor Jamie will love this example. Almost two years ago, we watched the Chicago Cubs win the 2016 World Series, right? And uh, it only took them, are you ready for this? It only took them 108 years to, to do it. 108 years to, to win the World Series. And that was quite a comeback, right? I mean, that was one that had been in the workings for a really long time. But there's all kinds of comebacks around us. Like if you look in the business world, um, we think of uh, Apple. Uh, Apple made a comeback in the 90s. They were getting ready to shut down. Um, they were getting ready to collapse, but they made a comeback through the iPhone and through uh, um, iPods. How many of y'all still have an iPod? Anyone still have one? All right. So I still have my original iPod. And uh, so they made a comeback in technology. And, uh, and so many companies like that have made massive comebacks. And we also, we like comeback movies. Like, there's always a comeback movie out that you can go see. I think the one that stands out in my mind the most would probably have to be Rocky. Um, but, you know, after Rocky, like, 15, I think no more comebacks. Like, Rocky should retire. But, um, but he made, you know, the first one, there was that comeback. And, uh, and so we're a culture. We live in a culture that loves comeback stories and stories where the underdog overcomes and wins. And I think Joseph's story tonight is really a, a lot of like that. It's, a, it's, it's that kind of story. His story is found at the end of Genesis. As a matter of fact, it takes up, I think, the last 14 chapters in Genesis. And we don't have time to unpack the entire story tonight. So we're just going to focus on one part of Joseph's story. And it happens to be the lowest part of Joseph's story. And, uh, and he's facing a pretty big obstacle. And he's stuck in prison. And he's been there for a long time. And he's forgotten. Nobody really knows he's there. And nobody knows who he is. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's a huge obstacle in his life. And Joseph, if you know anything about him, he came from a really big family. So he was the 11th of 12 sons. And, uh, and he was, uh, his family was pretty dysfunctional. Like as you read the last 14 chapters of Genesis, you'll figure that out. And his older brothers really despised him because, well, he was daddy's favorite. Like daddy loved him over all the others. And he kind of showed him. Like he wasn't afraid to let everyone else know. As a matter of fact, he made like a a really colorful coat for him, and it was made out of really expensive material, and he made one for him, but he didn't make one for the other 11 brothers. And, uh, and so his, 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 especially his older brothers really, really, really disliked Joseph. And so his dad one day, um, Jacob, who we talked about last week, uh, he sent Joseph out into the fields to help his brothers, and they decided, you know what, this is our chance. We've had enough. We're just going gonna, gonna to get rid of our brother. And they plotted to kill him. And, uh, but instead of killing him, they decided that they would just sell him into slavery. And, uh, and so they, they sold him into slavery, and he's on his way to Egypt. And then they went back and they told his dad that he was, uh, that he was dead, and that no one, and no one, and when I mean no one, no one was looking for Joseph. Now, while a slave in Egypt, he's accused of a crime he didn't commit, and he's thrown into prison, and he's left there to rot, and again, he's completely forgotten for, about, for many years. And this is where we're going to pick up Joseph's story. He's at the very lowest point of his life. Like if it couldn't, it couldn't get any worse. He, he's probably thinking to himself, it, it really, there's like nothing else that you can do to me. I, I'm at my worst place right here. No one's looking for him. He has no hope and he's in slammer. And at this point, you would think that surely Joseph's faith would be shaken. Like in this moment, like, okay, I can get over my brothers stabbing me in the back. I can get over being sold into slavery. I can get over maybe being accused of something I didn't do, but now I'm in jail and I've been forgotten and no one's going to come and rescue me and no one's going to get me out. Nobody's going to put up bail for me and I'm stuck here probably for the rest of my life. And you might think that surely his faith would like begin to weaken. But Joseph's story is a reminder for all of us that God is with us. God is with us even during the most difficult times. And I want you to hear that tonight because that's the really the big deal for us, that God is always with us even during the most challenging times in our lives. And it's during those times that God grows our faith or gives us a stronger faith so that we can overcome those challenging moments. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn to Genesis 39, or I'm going to show you a passage that's on the screen, Genesis 39, 21, and it says this. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now that verse simply tells us that God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph in prison and showed him 
his faithful love. God showed him in many different ways that he was going to be faithful to Joseph as Joseph was faithful to him. Now, a lot of us, we can kind of relate maybe right now, even in our lives, to Joseph. Maybe we feel like we're trapped in some sort of prison. Our circumstances are closing in on us, and we get it, and we feel like that, and we don't know how we're going to get out. We're, we're in the midst of an obstacle, then we're like, I don't know how I'm going to get over, around, or under this obstacle that I'm facing in my life. Maybe we're facing um, an overwhelming challenge, and no one, and we think no one's thinking about us. Maybe we're in the midst of this obstacle, and we're like, yep, nobody, not even my family, not even my, my spouse, or not even my best friend is thinking of me in the midst of this. And we get discouraged, and we're like, you know what, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to throw in the towel and quit. And maybe we're not even sure our faith can get us through. Maybe some of you have been stabbed in the back like Joseph's brothers did him. Or maybe some of you, someone has lied about you. And as they told lies about you, they've ruined your reputation. Or maybe you're facing a financial crisis. Or maybe your marriage is on the rocks or a career that's crumbling. Or maybe you've got this health problem that won't go away. Right now, it feels like you're in prison and no one's thinking of you and there doesn't seem to be any hope. Well, if that's you, I'm pretty sure that this is why Joseph's story is in the Bible. Like, I'm pretty positive that that's why God decided to put his story in the Bible, to remind us that no matter how hard life seems to get, and life can get hard at times, no matter how hard it gets, though, that God is there and he is faithful, just like he was faithful with Joseph. And when you and I, when we discover how to put our faith in him, we too can overcome. Because here's what happened, and Joseph's stories uh, ends really well. Like, his story ends pretty amazingly. Like, I'm not going to promise you that all of our stories are going to end the way that Joseph's stories end. Because not everyone in the Bible has a happily ever after story at the end of their story. Like, I think of the, some of the disciples. I mean, they were, they were tortured and they were killed because of their faith. Their story didn't end like we'd hoped. But Joseph's story is one of those, like, happily ever after endings. And, uh, and, and so today, I, and I want you to remember this, though that Joseph spent most of his life in the pit, overcoming some obstacle. Like most of his life was spent overcoming obstacles. So today, no matter what prison you might be facing, I believe that God wants to use those challenges in your life and in my life to help us to overcome and to grow our faith. So how does God use these challenges in our, in our lives to grow our faith? Well, I think first, in order to... Uh, for the challenges in my life to strengthen my faith, to my faith, I think the first thing we have to realize is I must turn to God during my challenges. I must and you must. we got to turn and face God in the midst of our challenges. In our story, Joseph is facing, again, one of the biggest challenges in his life. And Genesis 39.20 says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Now, this is not some cushy prison. This is not like a prison for, for white-collar criminals here. This is like a really bad place. It was a dangerous place and a place that was probably hopeless or without hope. And sometimes that's what life seems like. It seems like we're in the midst of our circumstances and we might as well be like Joseph in a prison with no hope. It's not easy. And there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of hope going around. But somehow in this prison... Joseph's faith was stronger. And you see, Joseph turned to God rather than turning away from God. That's huge. In the midst of your crisis, in the midst of whatever circumstances you might be facing, and we'll all face some kind of circumstance eventually, we have to remember, don't turn away from God, but turn towards God. And, and, uh, and so whenever you face a challenge, you always have two choices. You always have those two choices. You can either turn to God, or you can turn away from God. And often the first mistake that I'm thinking that we make I, as I'm learning about life, uh, often the first mistake we make when facing a challenge is we turn away from God. We like turn away from God and we often tend to blame God for our circumstance. But God is never the source of the trouble we're in. And I want you to hear that. God is never the source of the trouble we're in. It could be um, sin in our world that is the source. It could be our own decisions and choices. Imagine that. Like we could make some really 
bad decisions that have placed us in bad circumstances, and we often find ourselves there. But God, I want you to hear that God is never the source. But if we're going to overcome the challenge, we got to lean into God. We don't turn our backs away from God, but we lean in to God. So I wonder, who do you turn to for strength in the midst of your problem? Like, are you turning to God? Are you leaning into God? Are you trusting God in the midst of your circumstances? You see, my faith grows stronger when I turn to God during my problems. And my faith weakens when I turn to anything else but God in the midst of our problems. Problems only strengthen your faith, but only if you turn to God and you rely on Him to bring you through. Also, in order to stir, uh, for the challenges in my life to strengthen my faith, I must serve others when I feel stuck. Now, we talked about this when we talked about Joseph many months ago. We talked about this idea of in the midst of our struggles, we choose to serve others. And that's so counterintuitive to the way our world works. Like when we're in the midst of struggles, that's the last thing we're thinking about is serving other people. But I just want you to, ch- I want to challenge you. I think it's safe to say that in this story, Joseph is feeling stuck. He's been betrayed. He's been stabbed in the back. He's been falsely accused. He's been now stuck in prison. And what do you do in life when you feel stuck? When you feel stuck in a dead-end job, stuck in a marriage where you're not sure you're going to survive, stuck in a financial crisis, stuck in an unhealthy body, stuck in a stagnant relationship with God, what do you do? Well, think about Joseph for a minute. If um, if, if it would have been easy so easy for Joseph to just throw in the towel and have a pity party. It would have been easy for him to crawl into the corner of his cell in the fetal position, say, woe is me, I'm never coming out of here, leave me alone, life stinks, I just want to die. It would have been easy for him to do that, but he didn't do that. He didn't model that for us. Check out what Genesis 46-8 through says. It says, when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. Let me back up for a minute. Um, Pharaoh... Uh, he threw his uh, his cupbearer and his baker. I don't know. They must have had a fight, the cupbearer and the baker. I mean, two weird people. But he throws both of them. They're kind of important people in, in his little team of people. And he throws them into into prison. And, uh, and, and while they're there, they both have these dreams that they don't understand. And so that's where we pick up in verse uh, 6. It says, when Joseph came in, uh, and to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. Now, like, I would underline that in my Bible because I think that's a key word or phrase. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are, you, why are your faces downcast today? And they said to him, we've had these dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. Tell me your dreams. So in the midst of Joseph being in prison, life's kind of stinking right now. He takes notice of other people and notices that they're downcast. He says to them, it says right there, he saw that they were troubled. Like how often when we're in the middle of a messy situation or circumstances, how often do we stop and look at the people around us? Like we're so focused on what's going on in our world, how often do we stop and say, hmm, Suzanne's looking a little troubled today. Like my life stinks right now, but Suzanne's looking a little down. I think I'm going to go ask her, why are you so downtrodden? And, uh, and, but that's exactly what Joseph does. Instead of wallowing in his self-pity, he looks around and he notices the needs of others, and he begins to meet those needs. So he comes up to the baker and to the cupbearer and says, so guys, what's going on? Like, I notice you're down. I notice you're like kind of, your eyes are down on the ground. You're looking kind of sad. I know you're in prison and everything, but come on, like, why is life so rough? What's going on? And, 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 and he serves them. Now, as a pastor, I hear the opposite of this all the time. Like, people are always going through a rough time, and oftentimes they say to me, and I'm probably guilty of this too, they're, they they often say to me, "Listen, Pastor, I'm I'm really going through a rough time right now, and I think I just need to kind of pull back the reins. I'm not going to be able to serve for a while. I'm not going to be. I'm, I just need to. I need to focus on me and my needs for a little bit. And I can tell you, that's like the worst thing that you can do. Like when you're in the midst of a of a, a crisis, the worst thing for you to do is pull back from church and pull back from serving and pull back from from the people that you care about and focus on you. Because what happens? When you focus on you, well, your problems just get bigger. Like when you begin to focus on them, they started out this big, but by the end of the day, they're like huge and, and, and they're taking over. And so it's not never a good idea to solely focus on what's going on in your world. 
Secondly, when it's all about you, uh, you only focus inward, and you might miss the opportunity to get out of that bad circumstance. See, Joseph, that's what happened in his life. If he had been solely focused on him, if he had stayed in the corner of his cell in the fetal position, whining and moaning and groaning about his life, he would have missed his chance to get out of jail. And maybe you need to hear this tonight. Maybe that you need to hear that when you're stuck in the middle of your problem, that's the time for service, not for self-centeredness. Like when, when life's going south, don't pull back the reins. Don't go into your little tortoise shell, but serve. Find people that you can serve and love on. That's what Proverbs 11.25 says. It says a generous person will prosper, and it says whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Whoever serves other people will be refreshed. That when we begin to focus on other people and meeting the needs of other people, the Bible, the smartest guy in the world in Proverbs says, you'll be refreshed. So when you're dealing with stuff, don't don't go into your little cocoon, but look for ways to serve other people. The more you focus on your own problems, the emptier you will be, and the more afraid you're uh, you're going to feel. So take your eyes off yourself and serve others, and God will bless you. So I'm going to turn to God for my, uh, in my challenges. I'm going to serve others when I get stuck. And in order for challenges in my life to strengthen my faith, I don't become bitter when people will disappoint me. Look at the person next to you and just say, someone's going to disappoint you. Just go ahead. Tell them, someone is going to disappoint you. Someone in life, especially when you're in the midst of challenges, is going to disappoint you. Now, Joseph, he did the right thing. He interpreted the dreams for for the cupbearer and for the baker. And in return, Joseph only asked for a small favor. And that's where it says in Genesis 40, it says, uh, verses 14 through 15, it says, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house or prison. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. So Joseph's like, check it out, baker and cupbearer. When you get out, because you're getting out, I heard you're getting out. There's rumor you're getting out. I know you're getting out. You're getting out. And when you get out of prison, could you just put in a good word for me with Pharaoh? Like you're his buddies. You're his cupbearer and you're his baker. I mean, come on. Who else could go and tell the Pharaoh, I'm in here and I shouldn't be. Please get me out. And so he asked him to remember him when he gets out. But then look at what verse 23 says. It says, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Oh, like he gets out, and he's out because of this, this, the interpretation that Joseph gave of his dream, and he gets out of prison. And what is the first thing he do? He forgets all about Joseph. He forgets he even knew him. And I thought, that really sucks. Like, that's horrible. The person who helped forget all about him, the person he helped forgot all about him. Joseph was left in prison and disappointed. And it would have been very easy for Joseph to become bitter and angry and give up, but he doesn't do that. And I think this is huge for us. Like this is a really big deal for us because we find ourselves facing a challenge. And as we do, and as you're battling to get out of your prison, there are going to be people who disappoint you along the way. There just are. I tell people all the time, listen. I'm going to disappoint you at some point. Like, I'm going to do something that's going to hurt your feelings. I know I am because I'm not perfect. I'm human, and I'm going to make a mistake, and I just ask you to forgive me ahead of time for that because I'm not perfect. But people are always going to disappoint us and and along the way, and it will be very easy for us to become bitter, angry, or even say, you know what, I just quit. And too many times people get stuck in bitterness and anger. Let me say that again. Too many times we get stuck and bitterness and anger, and we lose our faith to overcome our circumstances. You see, you can't let the sins of others keep you from God's best. So don't don't become bitter. And next, in order to the challenges in my life to strengthen my faith, I must trust God is with me when I feel forgotten. Because here's the other thing. When you're in the midst of a circumstance or a trial, you're going to feel forgotten. You're going to feel like you're the only one going through it. And, uh, and it may seem like it's the end of the road. I mean, in Joseph's story, it seemed like it was the end of the road for him. And, uh, and he's been forgotten. But remember what Genesis 39, 21 said? It said, but the Lord was what? With Joseph. And showed him what? Steadfast love. And gave him what? 
favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Where is God when you feel alone and forgotten? The answer is simple. He's right there with you. If you have said yes to Jesus and you are in a relationship with him, God is right there with you. He's not going to leave you just like he didn't leave Joseph. There was never a point in Joseph's life when God was not with him. God was always there, and somehow Joseph trusted that God was in control even when no one else was. So how about you? Do you trust God is there and is, there and is never going to leave your side? If you're here tonight and you feel all alone, I want you to know that God will never, ever leave you. You see, as your faith gets stronger, you can trust that God is there even when you can't see it and others have left you. God is always there. And finally, in order for the challenges in my life to strengthen my faith, I must keep an eternal perspective when I feel like giving up. Two years, check that out. Two years had gone by since the cupbearer had gotten out of prison. He's already been in prison for a long time. And now two more years have gone by. And, uh, and Joseph, and Pharaoh, I mean, has a dream. Pharaoh has a dream, and nobody in the kingdom could interpret Pharaoh's dream. And then suddenly, the cupbearer goes, oh, there was that guy. What was his name? Je- Je- Joseph. Joseph, Pharaoh, there was that guy, Joseph, in prison. He interpreted my dream, and he interpreted the, the baker's dream, and I bet you he could interpret your dream as well. So they go into prison, and they get Joseph out, and they bring him to Pharaoh. And guess what? Joseph interprets his dream, and he ends up saving Egypt from a seven-year drought. Like, he interprets the dream, and it's a huge interpretation, and it saves the kingdom, and it was an awesome comeback. And Pharaoh likes Joseph so much that this is what happens in Genesis 41:41. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Now, there's not really a better comeback than that. He goes from the hated little brother to a slave to forgotten in prison to the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. And, uh, and how? Because Joseph kept an eternal perspective and he never gave up. Every day I imagine Joseph woke up and said, I may have lost everything else, but God is with me. I may have lost everything else. Nobody may remember me. Nobody may know who I am. But God knows me and God loves me you know some of us in here we're waiting for our comeback we are we're waiting we are waiting for God to rescue us from whatever circumstance or prison we find ourselves in and some of us may even feel like giving up tonight can I just say to you don't give up don't give up don't give up on your marriage don't give up on your dream don't give up on your future and most of all Don't give up on God. Don't ever give up on God. Trust Him. Trust that He will strengthen your faith, that He will keep you uh, and help you to overcome that obstacle that you're facing. Don't give up. Put your trust in Jesus. Let me share one more verse with you before we leave tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 through 18 says this. Paul says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. See, Paul had an eternal perspective. And he said, the troubles that I'm facing right now, they're light and they're momentary. And they won't last. And they are achieving for me an eternal glory. So, he says in verse 18, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. God is eternal, and he's with us every minute of every day. And a faith that overcomes never means that it's always going to be perfect, but it does mean that God will always, always, always see you through whatever obstacle you're facing. You see, Joseph was an overcomer. And you can be an overcomer too. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for my amazing friends that are gathered here today. 
God, thank you for the story of Joseph, and thank you for reminding us that when we feel like we're, our backs are up against the wall and we're not going to overcome whatever challenge is facing us, that, Lord, you promise that you're with us. God, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, and you make that promise throughout your word. God, story after story reminds us that you, you make good on your word. So, Father, if there's someone in here tonight that feels like maybe giving up, feels like they've just too much is going on in their lives and they don't know how they're going to make it another day. They remember tonight Joseph's story. That if we will remain faithful to you, that you will always, always remain faithful to us. And you will give us the power and the strength to overcome whatever trial that we're facing. Thank you, Lord, for being a God that is always, Amen.